In this video, we're going to discuss further um, finding area under a curve. You're going to see a lot of questions being thrown at you in statistics that are basically just asking you to find area under the normal curve. Or, of course, other curves we'll see later. We'll find area under the t-distribution curve, and then we'll move on and we'll do the chi-square and the f. But it all comes back to finding area under a curve. And, of course, it doesn't matter what shape the curve is. You know, these are all supposed to be... Uh, normal distributions, pardon my horrible drawing skills, but we know that the total area always sums to 1. So when we're finding area under the curve, we're really finding probabilities of certain situations. So the area below a certain point is just the probability of having a result below that point, and the area above is the probability above, and the area in between, of course, is the probability in between. Now all three of these situations are all um, using the normal distribution in slightly different ways. This first question give you the standard normal, right? They say z is a standard normal variable, which means we're living on the normal curve, the standard normal curve. And all that means, if it's a standard normal curve, that just means that the average, right, mu equals 0, and it just means that the standard deviation equals 1, right? That's a standard normal curve. And then when we talk about distances away from the mean, and if we have a distance in this case of negative 0.73, so we're down here, right? This is about negative 0.73. That distance of a little less than 1, right? Negative 0.73 is almost 1. That distance of 1 also correlates perfectly to a z-score, right? A z-score just gives us distance in terms of standard deviations, but because our standard deviation is equal to 1, distance equals standard deviations in this case. So when we go up above 2.27, 2.27, again, that's a distance, but it really ends up being standard deviations, right? So it ends up being our z-score as well. And then if we want to find the area, right, this is just asking for the probability that z is in between those two. That's just asking for the area in between those two points. Now you can do this with the TI calculator very easily with the um, uh, norm, I think it's a norm CDF function. But you can also do this in StatCrunch even easier. So if we go over to StatCrunch, anytime we're trying to find area under a curve, okay, so keep this in mind, whether we're finding area under the normal curve, the t-distribution, any of those things, it's always stat calculators. And then you can see under calculators, we've got the binomial, we've got the chi-square, the f that we'll see later, we've got the t, we've got the Poisson if we have to do that, and of course we have the normal. And this brings up our, our, our little normal curve. Now it, it starts off in the standard position, which is just you give it the mean and the standard deviation, and then you decide if you want area below or above, right? And some number, 2 let's say, tell it to compute, and there's the area above 2, so there's the probability. But we don't want area above and below, we want area in between, so we click on the between button. And now it gives us the same curve, but we have extra boxes to fill in, right? Well, because we're dealing with the standard normal curve, the mean is 0, standard deviation is 1, we don't have to change that at all. So all we have to do is change this to 0.73, change this to 2.27, and tell it to compute. And there's the area in between those two z-scores, right? In this case, in this case, it's not really an x, it's a z-score. But this is the general curve that works for everything. So if the mean is not 0 and 1, then these become x's, as we'll see in our other examples. So in this case, it's still called an x, but it really is a z because we're just in this special case where we're on the standard normal curve. So over here, our answer very easily, very simply, is just going to be 0.7, let's say 5, 5, 7, if we round to four decimals. And remember, that's a, that's a probability, right? That's the probability of having a sample in between those two values. Okay, let's look at a second example. Assume that x has a normal distribution, right? So we're still on the normal curve. The mean is now 137. The standard deviation is now 5.3. You'll notice that these are um, population, 
right? These are parameters. This is based on population. It's a, the Greek letter mu and sigma. These aren't x bar and s. They're talking about what happens in the population. And then they ask, find the probability that x is between those two numbers, which is the same thing as saying what's the probability, right, that 134.4 is less than or equal to x is less than or equal to 140.1. Here's our normal distribution. Looks just like this one, you know, if I could draw. But now our average is instead 137. And our standard deviation now is 5.3 instead of 1. But it's really the same curve. In fact, if we go over here, change this to 137, change the standard deviation to 5.3. Okay, I'm going to go ahead and hit compute, and it's what it's doing right now is it's trying to compute. Uh, it's still trying to compute this area. I just hit compute because I wanted you to see how the uh, the curve changes, right? The curve still looks the same, but look what's happened. The scale now is different. The mean, right, the, the average is here now at 137, and our standard deviation is now 5.3. Kind of hard to see that our standard deviation is 5.3, but we know that if we go out roughly um, one, two, three standard deviations, it's almost all of our data. So if we go up roughly 15, Right from 137, we're up here at a little over 150, the, pretty much the end of our distribution. And same in the other direction, so you can see how that's roughly 5 in each direction. Okay, but let's change these to the numbers that we care about. So for this one, it wanted 134.4. Tab over and put 140.1. Hit enter. And we can verify that the picture matches what we're looking for. You should always draw a picture. And we know that we're looking for things basically from about 134 to 140, right? And we're looking for all of this stuff in between. And of course, the picture matches. And so we look down here and go, OK, this one, our answer is 0 0.4088 if we round to four decimals. OK, same exact question. Really, in theory, it's still asking for area under the curve. It's still asking for area under the normal distribution curve. Only now, the mean right, has changed to 137, and the standard deviation has changed. That's all, that, that's all that's changed. Same distribution, still a normal distribution. OK, our last example. We've got uh, women aged 18 to 24 have a systolic blood pressure. Um, normally distributed, that's important because now we need to know that we're still working with the normal distribution, with a mean of 114.8 and a standard deviation of 13.1. Okay, so you can think, all right, I'm going to come over here. 114.8, standard deviation of 13.1. And there's my new curve, right? If 23 women aged 18 to 24 are randomly selected, find the probability that their mean systolic blood pressure is between 119 and 122. So you think, okay, I come down here and I do 119 and 122, and it gives me that answer. And I write that down on my test, or I go and put that into my math lab or whatever, and it tells me I'm wrong. And you think, well, well what have I done wrong? Well, you've forgotten one small thing right? Your distribution is always based on if you sample one thing at a time. If we sample one thing at a time, we get a distribution with the same standard deviation as the population, 13.1. But we didn't sample one thing at a time, and we didn't ask for, um, you know, what's the probability that one woman's um, blood pressure is between these two numbers. We asked, what's the probability that the average of 23 women? So the picture on the left represents the average of 114.8 and a standard deviation of 13.1. This one over here represents an average of 114.8 and a much smaller standard deviation. You, you hopefully can kind of see it from my bad drawing that it's just, um, it's thinner, right? So it's a smaller standard deviation. 
Now, what is that new standard deviation? Some of you probably already remember, but if you don't, I have a, um, a video out there on my YouTube channel that talks about when do you divide by the square root of n. And this is where you would divide by the square root of n. The normal formula for calculating z-scores, if we were going to do this by hand, right, your z-score is just your data value minus the mean divided by standard deviation. That's when you're looking for a z-score for one thing. But if you're looking for the z-score for an average of things, right, an average of 20, uh, 23 things, then your z-score all of a sudden becomes uh, the average right, that you're testing, that number, minus mu all over sigma divided by the square root of n. Your standard deviation now gets smaller. It's being divided by that square root of n. And if you think about it, it makes sense because if you're sampling from a population, but you're now sampling larger samples, larger and larger samples, you're going to get less variability until you get to the point where you sample all of them and take an average. And every time you do that, you'll get the exact average of the group, right? You'll get the exact population average because you just sampled the entire population. So you'll get a perfect average of 114.8. And then you put all those back and then you sample again and you'll get 114.8 again. And you put them all back and take and you'll keep getting 114.8. You'll get no standard deviation, right? You'll get no variation because you're taking the entire sample each time. Okay, so as your sample size goes up, and you're taking those averages each time and you're writing them down and putting your numbers back into the population and taking another random sample of the same size. Every time you do that, if you're taking a bigger sample, you have less uh, freedom as far as where your mean will be, right? The more numbers you take from the population, the more it's going to have to be really close to the actual mean because you don't have the opportunity to let's say grab a bunch of numbers that are above the mean or just a bunch of numbers that are below the mean because if you're taking a large enough sample there just physically aren't enough numbers that are up there right if you think about it if you only had a hundred numbers was in your population you only have you know maybe four or five outliers in both direction really big ones <clears throat> really small ones in comparison to the average of your sample. So if you're taking a sample of 10 at a time, you could get all five you know, really big numbers and then maybe five kind of around the middle and you'll end up getting an average of that sample that is substantially bigger than the average of the whole group. And conversely you could also just take all five really small ones and maybe five more that are close to the middle and you're going to get an average from that sample that is much further away from the mean uh, than you would like and, and, and everything. But if now you're taking 50 numbers at a time, even if you get all five outliers from the top, the other 45 numbers are all going to be from the middle and they're going to kind of swallow up those outliers. They're going to, because there's 45 of them, they're going to even out that mean and you're still going to get an, a mean of your sample that is really, really close to 114.8. And if you do that over and over again, you just get less variability and so your standard deviation gets smaller, your curve tightens up, right? it gets thinner, and so now the probability of a small band of something gets bigger because it's taller and thinner. So instead of your standard deviation being 13.1, you have to actually plug into the calculator 13.1 divided by the square root of uh, 23 and you now get a standard deviation of 2.73153824. And now when you do that you can see how the scale changed drastically. Right? Look at how I only go from 115 out to 120, basically a, a, a distance of a little bit more than 5 in both directions gives me everything. Right? The, in fact, we can click on the, uh, the tick marks, the 68, 99.7. So here's my mean, here's 68, 99, 99.7, right? 99.7, almost all of my data is between 123 and 107 now. It's really shrunken up. And with the same numbers of 119 and 122 uh, in there, we now see that we have a much smaller answer right, of 
I guess, 7, 9, if we want to round to four decimals. Okay, so finding area under any curve, especially the normal curve, is super easy in StatCrunch. You just go over here to Stat, Calculators, pick the curve you're dealing with. In our case, we're dealing with the normal curve. When you do that, it pops up with the curve in the standard position, which is just area in one direction or the other, which is what you would use if you needed to answer questions like, what's the probability now that if you picked one woman at random that her blood pressure was above 122, right? Or a group of 23 women, what's the probability that their average blood pressure is, let's say, above uh, 120? There you have it right because we still have the same mean and standard deviation for the 23 women so we've got roughly a three percent chance of getting an average 23 women with a uh, sorry a, grabbing a sample of 23 women and having the average blood pressure of the entire group being above 120 okay that would be in the standard position and then we could of course do below and below 120 is obviously going to be one minus that so 97 percent and then between just gives us area in between two numbers it's that simple guys alright